Okay, so here are a couple of examples or statements of the current increasingly global cultural myth. So this is one that emerged with that explosion of the post-enlightenment industrial revolution in Europe and is now spreading around the world. It's the perpetual growth myth, the myth of progress. The idea that you can have unlimited growth, economic material growth, on a finite planet. Lawrence Summers, the author of this first statement, was the president of the World Bank when he made this statement in the early 1990s. Does anyone know his current position? All right. That's right. That's right. He is uh, President Obama's chief economic advisor. Okay. He is the chair of the U.S. President's Council of Economic Advisors. Lawrence Summers says, there are no limits to the carrying capacity of Earth. Remember that humans tend to press up against, well, he wouldn't believe there's any limits, so we can just go on forever, that are likely to bind at any time in the foreseeable future. The idea that we should put limits on growth because of some natural limit is a profound error with staggering social costs. Now, it has staggering social costs <coughs> because we use growth as the means by which to solve the problem of poverty. See, if we can grow sufficiently so that even the thinnest slice of the pie is large enough to keep people going, then they won't bug us to share. <laughs> so growth becomes a means by which we can avoid the question of more equitable distribution of the world's biological and economic output. And just to show that he's not alone, a couple <clears throat> years later, and you know, today one of the still m the most frequently quoted individuals is the late uh, Professor uh, Julian Simon from Maryland University, University of Maryland School of Business. Technology exists now to produce in inexhaustible quantities all the products made by nature. We have in our hands now the technology to feed, clothe, and supply energy to an ever-growing population for the next seven billion years. <laughs> now, again, not a modest statement, but the point is these kinds of statements are repeated over and over again by people who believe in the progress myth and the myth of infinite growth. This is a statement by a marketing expert in the mid-50s. In the post-war period, there was a lot of idle uh, factories and idle labor, uh, returning soldiers who didn't have enough to do, and factories that had been making tanks and guns and ships. Let's employ that capital in a productive way. But in order to do that, we had to break people out of the conserver habits that they had gotten into. So that people had gone through the depression, they'd gone through the rationing of the Second World War, they were getting used to living on very little. And by the way, they'd never been happier. <laughs> Suddenly, we've got a big problem. People aren't working hard enough. There's underemployed capital. So let's organize to create a new social mythology explicitly on purpose to make people into consumers. All right. So this is one of the most prolific writers of the period. He was a marketing expert. Our enormous productive economy demands that we make consumption a way of life, that we convert the buying and use of goods into rituals, that we seek our spiritual satisfaction, our ego satisfaction in consumption. We need things consumed, burned up, worn out, replaced, and discarded at an ever-increasing rate. And so began the history of the so-called consumer society, a deliberate social con construction that gave birth to the modern uh, advertising industry and uh, the compulsion that we all now uh, seem to have uh, to go to the store. The single most popular part of spare time activity in North America is shopping at the mall if you interview uh, people in a certain age group. So they were very successful in creating uh, consumers of us all and this is now spreading around the world. As consumption increases, because we now have an increasing numbers of billions of consumers and population is stro still growing at about 1% per year, then the impact that we measure by the ecological footprint is population times per capita consumption is continually arising. It passes carrying capacity. That's the Malthusian dilemma. We don't notice because we can appropriate goods and services from all over the planet after we've used up all of our own. 
So we overshoot, and the question is, is this decline going to be a planned, reasonable, slow, soft landing, or is it going to be a crash imposed by uh, real limits when we hit the, the wall? And here's the problem, uh, the other side of the problem, I keep going back and forth between the cultural, economic, or, or, and uh, the, the biological. This is the latest numbers I could get my hands on from the World Bank on the distribution of income on planet Earth today. Now keep in mind that when the growth dynamic got underway, uh, really about 50 years ago, and became the primary means by which to obliviate poverty, you would think that we would pay attention to the impact of that growth on poverty. But what we see here is that as of right now, the world's richest 20%, the 20% of the population who are the wealthiest on Earth, and by the way, every one of us in this room is in that category, right? We use about 76.6%. We get all that much of the world income, actually consume about 80% of world output. The poorest 20% of people on Earth get by on one and a one half percent of global output. And those ratios are worsening. So the question is, if you are an intelligent species, if growth is being designed as a means of reducing poverty, uh, why is it that we can go for 30 years in a failed experiment and not pay attention to the fact that it's not solving the problem that we set out to do? So the share of the private consumption by the poor is in decline. Most world growth goes to the rich who don't even benefit from it. Okay. Why is this problematic? Because if we're already at carrying capacity, but we're about 25 to 30 percent over carrying capacity, and it's 20 percent of the world's people who use 80 percent of everything, that, that right away shows you that we've got a problem. If everyone on the planet today consumed at the level of North Americans, we'd need the equivalent of four additional Earth-like planets to produce all those resources and to assimilate all of those wastes. Now, if you don't believe that, just think about it in terms of two nations. The United States has 4.7% of the world's population. 4.7% of the world's people. It uses between 20 and 25% of everything. About 22 or 3% of petroleum, for example. China has over four times the US population. Now, see what I'm saying here? If China achieves its goal of the same material standard as is now enjoyed by Americans, US plus China is 125% of the entire global economic and um, biological output. And you haven't even begun to count countries like Canada, Europe, India, Africa, and so on and so forth. So that's why we have fair confidence in the kinds of numbers that our footprint work uh, shows to be the case. We cannot, by any stretch of the imagination, reach a, uh, um, a stable, sustainable state through growth of the world economy uh, such that everyone uh, achieves the material standards to even pull them out of poverty, let alone live like North Americans. Okay. 